Welcome. Today, consumer advocate, environmentalist, and five-time presidential candidate Ralph Nader. Turns out for the past 15 years, he's been writing letters, first to President Bush, then to President Obama, challenging them on foreign and domestic policy. But the letters were not answered, rarely even acknowledged. However, we get to read them. Ralph Nader's rejected advice in just a moment. Also on the program, the coming robot revolution to explain the potential and the limits of robots that think Facebook's first director of artificial intelligence research, Jan LeCun, will be here. Then the low line and the Queen's night market, two creative urban projects that won't stay afloat unless you invest. And toward the end of the hour, what appears to be an effective way to cut campus sexual assaults in half. The focus, however, is not on the perpetrators. First, Ralph Nader. For years, he has been trying to affect presidential decision-making with letter after cogent letter to Presidents Bush and Obama, challenging policies from the Iraq invasion to the minimum wage. The presidents do not write back. But his ignored missives are now bound in a book called Return to Sender, Unanswered Letters to the President from 2001 to 2015. Ralph Nader joins us via Skype from Washington, D.C. Welcome, Mr. Nader. Hello. Thank you very much, Brian. Let me start with one that you wrote when President Bush was about to invade Iraq. And in this case, you didn't write to him. You wrote to his wife and to his parents, urging them to advise the president not to invade Iraq. Why would you write to them? Because in the prior five months, uh, about a dozen national groups, uh, business, uh, labor, peace groups, religious groups, student groups, even retired intelligence organizations, begged to meet with him at the White House uh, before he invaded Iraq. They wanted him to hear their views, and some of them had just come back from Iraq. And he didn't even bother acknowledging them. These were groups that had in the totality millions of members, and he totally closed them off, as he closed our request as well. So I thought maybe in the last moments before this criminal invasion that has created so much horror and devastation, uh, in its wake, uh, that we would appeal to his parents, the people who created him. And unfortunately, even that wasn't acknowledged. You also wrote a number of letters documenting the carnage of civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan from the post-9-11 invasions. Did you feel that the White House was somehow not getting the real numbers from their own sources? Yeah, they had a practice. It was rather uh, seedy, I think, they would uh, report fairly the fatalities, the U.S. fatalities. And by the way, veterans groups wanted to see him before the invasion, didn't acknowledge. Um, but they wouldn't fully report, Brian, the injuries because they wanted to lowball the American injuries in Iraq in order not to arouse the public, as uh, happened in Vietnam. And so they would only report the injuries incurred in the midst of a heated battle. Well, you know, the whole country was a theater of war. It wasn't like mass troops were going against one another. So the actual figure, which is not repeat, reported uh, when the press calls, uh, the actual figure is triple that. I see that at one point you actually received a letter requesting a financial donation to the George W. Bush Presidential Center. Did they realize who they were writing to? Well, they had my name. It was, you know, Dear Mr. Nader or Dear Ralph. Uh, and uh, both uh, uh, Bush and Obama wrote me a letter and they were asking for money. Uh, I wrote them back. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Bush wanted uh, uh, money sent for his presidential library in Texas. And so I said, well, I'm not going to send any money, but I'll send you a book. So I sent him the book by Clyde Prescott. It's entitled Rogue Nation. <laughs> I thought it should be in uh, Bush's presidential Library. I mean, you would write these presidents say, what's your policy on answering letters? What's your correspondence policy? Prime Minister of Canada acknowledges all the letters. And they wouldn't even reply, Bush and, and Obama. So what's happened is this most democratic form of uh, communication where a citizen writes an elected official, Brian, no one can censor or distort, is being degraded, excluded, dis disrespected. It's much worse than it was 20 years ago. In one letter, you suggested to President Obama a two-track presidential plan. What does that mean? Uh, Brian, that's why you're such a great uh, radio talk show host. Very few people raise that 
letter. That's a key letter. And it was, it was sent to President Carter and also uh, more recently to uh, Presidents Bush and, uh, and Obama. It basically says very simply, you have two tracks you pursue as a president. You should. One is you do the things presidents do all the time. You connect with Congress, you conduct foreign policy, you run the federal government. The second track, which I believe is the responsibility of the president under a constitution, is to empower the American people. It's to find ways to make it easy for people as workers, consumers, patients, uh, taxpayers, uh, communities to band together so they can have a seat at the table with the big boys from Wall Street and so they can uh, engage grassroots all the way to Washington in uh, deliberative democracy. And very few presidents recognize that. They say, well, elect me and I'll do this and I'll do that. They're going to do nothing if the top 1% uh, control the government, if you have Wall Street controlling Washington, otherwise known as the corporate state or what the right wing calls crony capitalism. Is there a difference, in your view, between the corporate state and crony capitalism? Because, again, to cite Jeb Bush in his announcement speech this week, um, he said that we have big government in this country, which means liberalism, big government liberalism. We have big government in this country because the lobbyists have the run of Washington. And I tended to think that to the extent that big money has the run of Washington, that that results more in conservative policy. So do you understand the difference between crony capitalism and corporate state? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, he should talk. Uh, the corporate lobbyists had the run of Tallahassee when he was governor of Florida. No, they all say the same thing, whether they're Republicans and Democrats. They're going to run the lobbyists out of Washington. And then they come and the lobbyists in K Street and, and the campaign money flows even greater from administration to administration. Uh, uh, crony capitalism in conservative doctrine basically means when uh, corporations have influence or control government and turn it to their benefit, like bailouts, handouts, giveaways, and against the people. Uh, the corporate state is a little more fundamental, theoretically, and that is when there literally is a merger of big business and big government, and not just in terms of lobbying. That is, uh, big business sends its leaders to run government, to become secretaries of defense, secretary of treasury comes from Wall Street so often. And, and you, can't tell, you can't tell them apart. There's so much money going into both parties on, uh, in Congress. You really can't tell them apart anymore. So I always say to people, don't ever use the word government uh, when you really mean corporate government, the merger of big business over uh, government. And Franklin Del Roosevelt warned about this in 1938, Brian, when he sent a message to Congress saying whenever government is controlled by private economic power, that's fascism. And that's what the doctrine of fascism really is before it had an, a different extenuation in World War II. It's the combination of private corporate power controlling government against its own people. Um, in one letter you suggested to President-elect Obama to have an inclusive inauguration, including the third party presidential and vice presidential candidates. Obviously, you've run as a third party presidential candidate. Why do you think he should include the loser in that respect? Because they all say, now I have been elected president, I, uh, Barack Obama, and I represent all the people and I want to unify our country. Well, one way to do it is to have a few seats at the inauguration stand near the White House in January and, and, and have the courtesy of uh, inviting the contenders who didn't make it, not just the Republican contender, but the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, the Conservative Party, whatever. Uh, but they never do that. I mean, th these letters are really almost like a course in political science and deliberative democracy. It, it's a good book to give to young people uh, who don't even know about writing letters, because when you write letters, even if they're not answered, Brian, you can still send them to the local press or send them to some magazine or send them to friends or relatives. And when you write a letter, you commit yourself to being a more engaged uh, citizen when you, instead of just griping orally and, and the groaning uh, and becoming a cynic and withdrawing. So that's why the book Return to Sender, I think, has a larger meaning. Is there a kind of futility, though, in writing letter after letter knowing that none of them are going to be responded to? Would you be better off? Would you have been better off in the last 15 years organizing citizens on social media or something like that? 
Well, you got to do that too. They're not uh, contradictory to one another. But remember this, even if they don't acknowledge it, they count it. So like if I'm the GM uh, recall of defective cars, they start getting a torrent of letters saying, we want to up, you know, we want stronger criminal penalties. We want stronger recall requirements on these corporations with their defective cars they're selling us. They get their fingers to the wind, the politicians, the senators, representatives, the White House. So they do count them. They have streams of volunteers that go to the White House every day on big tables, and they sort out 600,000 letters a week. Uh, and some of them get form letters. If you invite them to your high school graduation, they'll send you a regret letter. Uh, they, they'll send letters to their contributors, or if they want a prop letter by an 11-year-old that sends a cute letter to the president. But substantive letters by people are now not even acknowledged. And I, I really, I hope people will demand the decency of an acknowledging the letters, because at least, you know, it wasn't sent to a dark hole. Your previous book was about a left-right coalition that you saw forming or that could form. As we speak, there is kind of a left-right coalition in Congress that's defeating the president's free trade agenda with the Pacific Rim nations. Do you see that as an example of something new? Precisely. It couldn't have happened without defecting Republicans and defecting Democrats uh, and uh, creating a majority uh, to block the trade assistance. Uh, they're still going to come back, but it was a stunning blow to President Obama and, and Republican Speaker uh, John Boehner. We've seen it around the country now, left-right coalition, believe it or not, even on the minimum wage restoration. That's why uh, cities and states are increasingly increasing the minimum wage, not waiting for the federal government to go from $7.25 frozen minimum wage up to, if it was adjusted for inflation since 1968, uh, 30 million people would get a raise up to $11 an hour. So even there, there's a conservative liberal. You know, people don't know that Mitt Romney, Tim Pawlenty, former governor of Minnesota, Bill O'Reilly, uh, Phyllis Shafley, uh, Rick Santorum all come out for a higher minimum wage because they don't want more public assistance uh, on the taxpayers' back. They don't want poor people who can't make it in Walmart because they don't pay them enough going on Medicare, housing assistance, energy assistance, uh, uh, food stamps, etc. So they may have different reasons, but there is a real political alignment on over 20 issues, major issues in our country, Patriot Act, anti-civil liberties, bloated defense budget, empire, corporate welfare, uh, prison reform. It's all underway, uh, but it's, it's almost never uh, publicized because the, the media follows the divide and rule tactics of the power brokers as to where the left and right do disagree and clash. Another shocking one to me just recently was when the Nebraska state legislature overturned the death penalty in that state, and that's a very Republican conservative legislature, and their grounds were conservative as they saw it. One, the execution of people is big government. That's a Republican argument. And two, it's more expensive because of all the appeals and everything to execute somebody than it is to keep them in prison for the rest of their lives. At least that's what the legislators argued. So that was the conservative case against the death penalty in the uh, very right-wing uh, legislature of Nebraska. We're going to see more of that state legislatures. Uh, you already have Grover Norquist and, and uh, uh, Newt Gingrich uh, getting together in a group called Right on Crime for prison reform, juvenile justice reform. And they make the arguments you pointed out. It's too much big government for nonviolent event offenders being sent away for 20, 30 years for smoking this and that. Uh, and it costs a lot more. The tax dollar issue is big in the right wing move for prison reform. You even in the book use the term Obama Bush as if they're a plant or as if they're one entity. But you know that some progressives were critical of you for running uh, so hard against Al Gore uh, and seeing him and George W. Bush as being so similar that it was worth uh, you running the campaign that you did and the price that many progressives feel the country paid for that. Um, is there really no meaningful difference, in your opinion, between Obama and Bush? I never said no difference on anything. Uh, by the way, the Democrats could have blocked Bush's war in Iraq. They could have blocked his tax cuts. They had the votes to do it, the filibuster to do it. 
after he was appointed by the Supreme Court. He was never elected. He lost the popular vote. Um, there was a the, joke in 2004. You know, there was a joke in 2004. Did you ever hear it? When Kerry was running against Bush that went, it's likely to be another close election, five to four. <laughs> That's true. The Supreme Court, five Republicans against four Democrats. Who says politics doesn't affect judicial nominations, huh, Brian? Uh, they are different on, on a number of issues, uh, basic social services, um, Medicare, for example, Medicaid. Uh, Democrats are better. Uh, Democrats uh, are often better on <clears throat> consumer policy, but they talk a better game than they actually produce uh, in Congress. But on the really big issues like empire, war, military budget, dialing for the same corporate interest dollars, uh, corporate welfare, they're almost indistinguishable. Now, there are certain uh, defectors on both sides, like we talked about on the Trans-Pacific Pacific, uh, trade deal. Uh, but by and large, in those major areas, selling our elections, empire and huge diversion of tax dollars from repairing America to blowing up overseas and increasing more and more opposition against us, not like it's working, uh, and the corporate taxation loopholes, it's the same. Planning on writing any letters to the current presidential candidates, including Hillary Clinton? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I will uh, write letters uh, when it gets closer to the primaries, laying out what I think they should be talking about, the stands they should be taking. I think a lot of other citizens should do the same. Uh, going to uh, Iowa, uh, going to New Hampshire in the early uh, session. But the, the uh, entry of Donald Trump, oh, can you imagine what that's going to do to the Republican uh, nomination uh, extravaganza? It's going to burlesque it. I think all the Republican candidates for president are going to be horrified if Donald Trump and his pomposity and his wild extravaganzas <laughs> enters into the uh, presidential campaign. Here's a man who's about to disclose his net worth, but it, but it, it's uh, it's like assets without liabilities. It's going to be a circus, and I don't think uh, more serious candidates on the pre on the Republican side are going to appreciate it at all. Finally, for people who think you're all work and no play. Didn't you also write a letter urging Mariano Rivera not to retire as the Yankees' closer? Oh, yes. Uh, I started out as a Lou Gehrig fan. and He influenced me a lot because he showed stamina. You know, 2,130 straight games without missing a game until Cal Rip Ripken uh, broke his record. Um, yeah, I wanted Mariano Rivera to stay another year. He had lost a year uh, because of a foot injury. Uh, and so he had rested his arm. And I thought, well, we need another year of Mariano. But I guess he had had enough. No, I do follow sports. We have a sports group, Brian, because uh, the fans need representation on so many areas, including being gouged and being required to pay for stadiums and ballparks. It's called, uh, it's called uh, leagueoffans.org for anybody who wants to go and see it, leagueoffans.org. And that's where we leave it, with Ralph Nader. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Always thank you, Brian. You're a great uh, talk show host. Robots with artificial intelligence have long been the subject of dystopian cinema, going back as far as 1927 with Fritz Lang's Machine Mensch and Klaatu in 1951 from The Day the Earth Stood, Stood Still. But fantasy is now giving way to a gold rush of reality as major tech companies like Google, Facebook, and China's Baidu race to develop smart machines that will serve us, we hope, in everyday life. Yes, the robots are coming, but according to our next guest, they will not be like us. Here to explain what robots can and can't do and to introduce us to the concept of deep learning is computational neuroscience expert and Facebook's first director of artificial intelligence research, Jan Lukun. Welcome to our program. Thank you for coming in. Pleasure to be here. First, for people who were completely confused by that intro, except that you come from Facebook, and think, oh, what is Facebook interested in machine learning for? Isn't this the place where we establish friends and share our photos and things like that. Right, so we, Facebook's main mission is to, is to connect people. And connecting people nowadays means sifting through ridiculous amounts of information. So if you connect on Facebook, Facebook could show you on the order of 2,000 items 
every day, but nobody has time for this. And so what we need to do is analyze the, the content of things that we can show you, uh, text, images, videos, etc., comments, and then uh, match that with your interests. So we, we, show, we show you things that are, you're most uh, likely to be interested in. That's kind of the primary uh, function. But there's all kinds of other things, like filtering content, say, for example, filtering out violent content um, or offensive content in general, and uh, you know, assessing the quality of various content. There's a lot of operations that require to, uh, uh, computers to understand things. So what does this term deep learning mean when it comes to computers? So deep learning is a, a set of techniques that has emerged um, in the last, that's become very, very popular in industry in the last uh, five years, roughly. Uh, the set of techniques have been around for a long time, actually, more like, like 30 or 25 years. Um, and those techniques are called deep because the, the systems that, that uh, implement them are composed of multiple layers. Um, and to some extent, some of those systems are inspired by the architecture of the visual cortex when we try to apply them to image recognition or the auditory cortex when you want to uh, apply them to speech recognition, for example. So deep learning and machine learning is another term that we hear these days. Is that the same thing? So machine learning is a, a more a broader set of techniques, if you want, that, that's been in, in very wide use. Uh, in industry and, um, of course, a uh, topic of research in academia for, for decades. Uh, you know, uh, your, your, your mail system uses this to filter spam, for example, and you know, Google uses it to, to uh, uh, do all kinds of things on search engines on YouTube, et cetera. Uh, Including even to drive its driverless car at Google, right? That's right. So machine learning is used in robots, in driverless cars, in uh, mm -hmm. uh, smart cameras. So if you have a camera that detects a face, uh, for example, you know, your, your smartphone does that, your camera does that as well. Uh, that system has been built with machine learning techniques. And deep learning is sort of a, 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 a subset of machine learning techniques that happen to be particularly powerful for things like image, natural language, and speech recognition. So I want to show a video that may be a good example of this. Um, called Baby's First Words, you're not going to believe what you see a computer do. Okay, so here's Baby X, and this is, um, she's been learning to read words. So here's her first word book. So let's see what she can see. It's in her page. And here we go, let's see what she, what's this, baby? What's this? What's this? What's this? Good girl. Now see if she knows what the word is. Okay, baby, look over here. Okay, what's this? What's this? Good girl. Right, let's try on something else. Okay. Okay, what's this? Baby, baby, over here. What's this? Baby, look at me. Look at me. What's this? Baby, over here. Over here. Good girl. Well, that's what she's just read. Now, see if a picture. Okay, baby, what's this? What's this? Good. See if she can read the word too. Okay, baby, baby, what does this say? Come on, over here. Look at me. Focus. Baby, over here. What's this? Good. Okay, let's try on something else. Baby, baby, what's this? What's this? What does this say? Good girl, well done. Let's see if she knows what the picture is. Bobby, Bobby, what's this? Bobby, focus. Come on, over here. Look. Bobby. What is it? Milk. Yes, it is milk. Okay, well done, baby. Okay, good girl. Good girl. Baby X. Now, before you get your heartstrings too tugged on, that was not a real baby. That was an artificial baby. That was a computer simulation of an image. There was no kid that he was communicating with, like via Skype or something, right? Right. Um, yeah, this, is, uh, this looks impressive on the face of it. Uh, the basic technology to build something like this has been around for a very long time. So it's a, you know, a combination of character recognition which has been around for a very long time, simple object recognition from images, speech recognition, speech synthesis, and then simulating uh, attention and animation and emotions on the face. Um, this does not 
it, although it, it looks impressive on the face of, face of it, this does not reflect any kind of intelligence on the part of the simulated baby. It's, um, uh, I wouldn't say it's a parlor trick, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty close to that. It can read the image. That might have been the more surprising part to people, not just the words, the letters, puppy. It sees the image and says puppy. Right. So um, image recognition um, essentially had a very hard time. People had a very hard time making those things work until fairly recently, about, uh, about three, four years ago. The technology was uh, certainly capable of doing this kind of, uh, this kind of task where the object is standardized, it's on a white background, it's, it's you know, surrounded by a black uh, stroke, so it's very easy to, to identify. It's, you know, uh, there's no variability in the, the milk bottle, it's always the same one. Um, but it's very difficult to be able to identify, say, a chair. Chairs can appear in all kinds of different shapes and forms. Um, they can be on, you know, in front of structured backgrounds. They, they, they could be someone sitting in it. And so the, the variability, the visual variability of the, the chair category is very difficult. But in the last two or three years, we've, we've started to have techniques based on deep learning that are capable of essentially recognizing any object in, in pictures, including things like obscure species of dogs and, you know, breeds of dogs and things like that. So what's an example of what this deep learning might be used for? Going down this road of recognition plus the image of something that looks like a person or, you know, things that either scare us or <laughs> things that can actually be very functional. Right. So there, there is a, a number of applications that have already been deployed uh, using deep learning. Some of them actually quite a long time ago, about 20 years ago, for doing things like reading the amount on checks. Uh, um, uh, something I participated in when I was working at Bell Labs in, in New Jersey. Uh, more recently, though, companies like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Baidu, etc., uh, have been using this for speech recognition and for, um, uh, for, for image recognition. For speech recognition, if you have an iPhone or Android phone and you speak to it, uh, your voice is being recognized by a deep learning system. It's trans being translated into text by a deep learning system. And that's, that only happened in the last two or three years. Um, for, uh, for image recognition, uh, it's used for um, organizing photo collections, for example. So you can search through photo collections through keywords uh, because the system has been able to identify all the objects in your, in your pictures. Mm. Uh, it's also able to identify similarities between images, so you know, whether they are kind of um, um, yeah, I mean, similar layout or you know, kind of similar series of objects in it. And of course, there's another application um, uh, that concerns face recognition. So uh, social networks in particular, uh, Facebook is, is uh, it's very interesting for people to be able to label their friends in pictures that they upload on, on Facebook. And, um, and we use face recognition uh, based on deep learning methods for that. Can it recognize me when I was 14 years old in a photo from knowing me now? There is some limit. It will recognize mm -hmm. you if you take out your, your glasses or, <laughs> or maybe shave your beard, but uh, maybe not when you were 14 years old. No. So if this is the kind of function that deep learning is enabling, and I realize there are many other things in many directions than the popular applications that you just described, but when we think about artificial intelligence, do we tend to think about the wrong thing, that is, think of a human-like, anthropomorphized robot walking around or in the science fiction dystopias that I referred to in the introduction, starting to order us around? Right. Um, so the systems we're building now, the, the, the ones for which we have the technology uh, available to build today, are, are, are very are not autonomous. They, they, they cannot really sort of make decisions on any topic. They, they are very, they're built for a particular purpose, like driving your car, organizing your photo collections, filtering your spam. Um, so it's very specific, and there is, there is no chance that any of those systems will kind of somehow, you know, train themselves to do other things. Um, you know, think of an um, electronic chess player, right? It, it just plays chess. That's what it does. Um, so this can and, be very and useful. And it wins. And it wins, exactly. So in some ways it's smarter than you, but in many ways uh, it's much less general than you in terms of, you know, it doesn't have general intelligence. It doesn't have any motivation, it doesn't have any feelings. Um, so those techni techniques can be very useful um, and bring a lot to society, like, you know, uh, you know we're starting to, to see uh, 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 safety systems for cars that, you know, detect 
uh, obstacles, pedestrians, uh, you know, keep, help you keep in lane, etc. Those things are going to pop up in most cars over the next uh, the next few years. Uh, that will reduce the amount of uh, the of, of, of uh, accidents on the, on the, in the roads. You have other applications in you know medical image analysis. You know systems that can analyze pictures and detect tumors. You know sometimes better than uh, than, than uh, human experts. So those are extremely beneficial uh, applications. Um, so is the ultimate goal to mimic the human brain in some sense, or is that just another incorrect way to think about it? It's a bit of an incorrect way to think about it. We get inspiration from the brain. So some of the systems we, we, we design, uh, particular technique called convolutional networks, which we use for image and speech recognition, is actually inspired a little bit by, 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 by the brain. But, uh, but it's a very tenuous uh, uh, inspiration, if you want. The, those systems are inspired by the brain the same way airplanes are inspired by birds. Of course, you know, they have uh, wings, they fly through the air, and they generate lift the same way, but they don't flap their wings, they don't have feathers, etc. So there is, there is a big difference. Uh, the, the underlying principles might be the same, but the details are very different. And there's a principle here that you call <coughs> cargo cult science. <laughs> Explain that. Uh, okay. Um, well, in the context of uh, AI and brain research, uh, there are some, some people who have thought uh, that by copying every details of how the brain works very accurately and simulating this on a giant supercomputer, somehow AI will emerge. And um, I, I do not believe this at all. Um, um, so I, I, I call this cargo called science because uh, it has the appearance, uh, the, the system you will simulate will have the appearance of, uh, of a brain, but the, the, uh, the real underlying principles will, will not be present. So it looks a little bit like uh, population in the Pacific who are kind of building, you know, fake radios and trying to call uh, uh, airplanes after World War II, after the American... But there are people who disagree with you, right? Like Ray Kurzweil, yeah. who works for Google, I think theorizes that there's going to be a confluence between biology and artificial intelligence by the year 2045 or something. Okay, so th there is certainly an inspiration of artificial intelligence uh, by biology. I work with neuroscientists, I'm, I'm you know, very active in this, in this area. And so, yes, I, I, certainly, I certainly believe this. The question is, um, so the, the calculation that, that uh, some people have, have been making is trying to estimate the computational um, uh, limits? capacity or yes. limits or um, uh, complexity, if you want, of, of, of the brain. So how many operations per second can the brain do that we might need to reproduce this in a computer? And if you run the numbers, you know, you assume Moore's law, where, you know, indicates that the power of computers doubles every 18 months is going to continue for, for a couple of decades, um, then the amount of computation within a factor of 10 crosses the, uh, that we can implement with computers kind of crosses the uh, uh, computational power of the brain, you know, sometimes in the, you know, 2030, 40, 50, it depends uh, how complex you estimate this is. And so, you know, some people not hesitate to kind of go to the next step and say, now that we have the computers that are powerful enough, we can build uh, AI systems that are more intelligent than humans. But of course, you know, there is a lot of obstacles. So finally, Facebook being a social company, are you researching different kinds of deep learning applications than Google, which is primarily a search company? A lot of them are the same. Uh, so things like basic techniques, basic machine learning techniques, which um, are, um, by the way, are done in the open. So we do our research, we publish everything we do, we even distribute our code in open source. So there's nothing secret about it. There's no, um, you know, it's, uh, we, we share a lot of, we do, we use the same tools as, mm -hmm. as, as Google, in fact, so mm -hmm. we, we share code with them. Um, and um, the, 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 the basic techniques that we're developing are very similar. Um, we're part of the same research community, if you want. Uh, the applications are mostly similar. Some of them are different, of course. So, you know, we are interested in connecting people. They're more interested in connecting people to content. But we're also interested in <coughs> connecting people to content. Um, and they have some, you know, social services as well. So, um, uh, I mean, social network services as well. So, so it's very similar. So being somewhat cautious, I will wish you good luck, but not too much good luck. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Up next... Two wonderful urban projects that will not make it unless we kick into Kickstarter. How to raise funds for your music album, tech project, or humanitarian campaign is a no-brainer nowadays. Kickstarter, GoFundMe, Indiegogo, and other online crowdfunding sites 
are the go-to sources for handling the upfront costs of creative projects. But how often are these open donation platforms used to enhance city life, to change something in the actual fabric of our big city? Two Kickstarter campaigns going on right now seek to do just that. One, the Queen's Night Market was launched earlier this summer. The International Nighttime Bazaar has brought cuisines and arts from around the highly diverse borough of Queens to the parking lot of the Corona Flushing Meadows Park. It's been a hit on Saturday nights. However, to keep the hot sauce flowing all summer long, the Queen's Night Market is back on Kickstarter. And then there's the low line. The idea here is to take the abandoned underground trolley terminal that we never knew existed at the foot of the Williamsburg Bridge and transform it into a subterranean park using a new technology that streams in the sunlight from above. Now the team creating the low line is also back online, hoping for the funds to get a low line laboratory running this year. What's it take to keep a good idea going? Joining us, Queen's Night Market founder, John Wang, and co-creator of the low line project, Daniel Barish. Welcome. Uh, John, we have a video that shows the Queen's Night Market a little bit. Do you want to set this up for us? Sure. Um, well, we were on Kickstarter about three months ago with a campaign that didn't, didn't fund. Uh, we found private money at the last minute to sort of get it to launch. So, you know, the first Kickstarter fund was tough because we had stock images from night markets from around the world. Uh, but one thing that launching actually enabled us to do was create video from our actual night market. So, um, this was so, so here's, a, here, here's the first minute or so uh, to let you see what the Queen's Night Market is like and why it's so cool. Hi, I'm John, and this is my second Kickstarter video. I was here four months ago asking for your help to bring a night market to New York City. I wasn't able to raise the funds then on Kickstarter, but managed to scrounge up enough money from friends and colleagues in the 11th hour to get the project up and running. After six night markets, I feel like we've proven the concept and shown that New York is ready and has been itching for a night market of its own. But now we need you to help bring it back in July and help make it a permanent fixture. This started over 15 months ago as a personal project and a personal passion, but has grown into something so much bigger. Each night, the Queens International Night Market has drawn thousands of visitors of all ages, from all backgrounds, from all over New York. We've had street food, art, and merchandise from all over the world. We have featured capoeira and Chinese dance troops, Latin bands, jazz quartets, and more. Even the mayor and the governor have given the night market their support. New York City has so much diversity, and Queens alone represents over 135 languages and 100 nationalities in over 90 distinct neighborhoods. We will continue to tap into this amazing tapestry to make the night market a uniquely inclusive, representative, and cultural event. All right. Where was that exactly? Um, that takes place uh, mostly, well, the actual market itself takes place in uh, New York, the New York, Car New York Hall of Science in the parking lot. Uh -huh. And night market means it's just like a street fair, but it happens after dark? Um, that's the easy explanation, yeah. Um, but they have a sort of unique energy and uh, they sort of, you know, bring out people that in lieu of going to, you know, maybe restaurants or bars or theaters, you do this for an evening. So it takes sort of entertainment space as well as a sort of... And I heard that you're so into this that you dropped your day job. Um, I did drop my day job. Also a night job. I was a lawyer beforehand. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> right, corporate yes, lawyer. when you're a corporate lawyer, you work day and night. Right, exactly. Yes. And now you just work night. And that's why you're doing it. So you don't have to work day and night. Only at <laughs> night for the night market. All right, we'll come back to the night market. Uh, tell us about, and you were here once before, describing the low line. So uh, set up the video that we're about to see and tell us where you're at now. Yeah, so the, like you said, the Lowland is a plan to build the world's first underground park here in New York City. And uh, we actually uh, launched a Kickstarter campaign back in 2012 to really just get the idea started so we could build a prototype and so people could see what the Lowland could look like. Um, and we did that. We've done a lot of different things since then, which I can update everybody on. Uh, but now we're actually building uh, what we're calling a Lowland Lab, like you said, which will be a six-month-long uh, scientific solar technology laboratory and interactive exhibit so that people will really be able to see and feel uh, the low line uh, for a longer period and also so that we can do the research we need uh, to really demonstrate how the thing will actually work. And what are we going to see in the clip? Uh, well, we're going to uh, give a quick update on what the project is and then talk specifically about where our research is heading and how um, you know, some Kickstarter backing will help us get there. All right. Low line under the Manhattan side of the Williamsburg Bridge.
Five years ago, we hatched a crazy plan to create the world's first underground park, the Low Line. The core feature of the Low Line is that we can take natural sunlight, send it underground, and use that to grow stuff. With this natural sunlight, we can take an abandoned trolley terminal, which is a football field-sized piece of New York City history, and transform it into a vibrant public space filled with plants and trees, and to create something unlike anything the world has ever seen before. The Low Line is more than a cool idea. It's a plan to revitalize and enhance an entire neighborhood. All we're doing is revealing something which has been there longer than most of the people in the area, and we're just re-exposing it for people to see. In 2012, our community began the, our very first Kickstarter campaign. Since then, we've refined our solar technology, developed a clear method to bring sunlight underground, and engage with local residents to collectively imagine how the low line can best serve our community. So we're coming to you at Kickstarter again to help us move the low line closer to reality. We're going to build a bigger, badder, more mind-blowing tech prototype in the form of the low line lab. All right. So let's talk about the crowdfunding. As it said, as you said in there, we're going to Kickstarter again. Is this what Kickstarter is for? People might think, oh, well, I'm going to give to each project that I find interesting enough on Kickstarter one time because it's to give it a kickstart. Now they're coming back. So talk about crowdfunding as you see it in relation to your project. Yeah, I mean, I think the Kickstarter model is a, a, a really important uh, part of the funding ecosystem for lots of different kinds of projects. I think Kickstarter probably got its start with a lot of um, smaller creative projects like finishing a film or um, a, a music album, uh, some graphic designers. There's a lot of different applications for Kickstarter. I think over the last couple of years we've seen people uh, like the Queen's Market and Lowline and other projects like the Plus Pool and, and others go to Kickstarter to really help uh, with public design projects. And I think the central thesis there is, uh, you know, people actually really do care about public design projects and want to contribute what they can. And the only difference between, I think, um, funding in this way or something else is just giving people the opportunity to fund it at a really small level. So micro donations that are a dollar on, our, on our, our current campaign, people can con contribute a dollar. Everyone has a dollar, presumably, right? Um, and so that gives you a way to actually plug in and engage. Um, and it also provides, I think, public design projects something that's even more essential, which is visibility, uh, promotion, and an ability to connect with lots of different kinds of people and to be on shows like, like yours. And in your case, uh, there was a first crowdfunding project. Right. Tell us about that and why you're back at this time. Right. Well, the short story is that our first one didn't fund. Um, and as I said, I think it was difficult to, you know, I think crowdfunding is also difficult when you're trying to pitch an idea. You know, it's, if you have something tangible, you can tell and show people it's something different. But, you know, in my case, I think it was tough because we had pictures from Asia and Africa and South America, but we didn't have one of our own to uh -huh. show. Um, so, you know, there's an education process that went along with the first one that maybe we didn't do a great job or maybe we just didn't get the exposure or people didn't know what to expect. Um, and so... You know, as I said, we managed to sort of launch at the last minute thanks to the sort of generosity of some private contributors. Um, and this thing has, you know, it's outdoors at night where there's no real infrastructure, so it's incredibly expensive. And you know, one of the missions of our the market is to make it affordable for our vendors as well as the visitors and sort of keep it free to the public and make it a real community sort of event. Um, and so costs maybe got a little bit out of control over the first six weeks of it. And so... You know, in order to bring it back, we'd like to, I mean, we can bring it back in a number of ways, but we'd like to bring it back the way it, I, I always envisioned it, which is free and affordable. Right. So, And then it'll presumably get off the ground as a business and uh, fund itself, because it's a for-profit entity, right? Right, right. It's structured as a for-profit entity, and I think, uh, you know, we've been, we've been very transparent about, we think we're, dri you know, we're drawing an incredibly diverse demographic every night and by the thousands every night. So I think uh, it's a real opportunity for sponsors, uh, for whatever reason they might want to jump on board, to uh, align with us and uh, help support it. Dan, what will visiting the low Like lab be compared to visiting the low line itself? So uh, the low line lab will basically take place in a 5,000 square foot warehouse space, uh, a former market building, so it itself has some industrial heritage to it. Uh, we're installing uh, solar collectors on the rooftop of this building and piping natural sunlight into the space that will be otherwise blacked out. Um, and we'll have that open for six full months. Uh, we're also partnering with some incredible landscape design uh, partners, including um, uh, Sidney Nielsen and uh, uh, Terrain and, and Brooklyn Botanical Garden, 
to actually build these stalactites and stalagmites of magical green stuff. So plants and trees, maybe even some edible plants and flowers uh, to actually really bring this magical experience to life for people. So there will be a, a, a simple inter, uh, interactive exhibit dimension of this, but the other side of this is that it's actually an open laboratory where we will very actively be testing how, much, how many lumens we actually uh, can bring into the space, uh, how the plants survive, uh, how the plants survive in September versus February, and then really human experiments on uh, how do people use the space, what will uh, be the, the real value of this over time from a community standpoint. And um, you know, the, central the central difference is the low line itself will actually be about 10 times bigger, and it will be underground. <laughs> so this is actually not underground, uh, but in all other respects, I think it will approximate the feeling, and it will certainly give us a very realistic sense of how the science will work and how the plants will work. You guys should team up because it sounds like you have a great warm weather venue and you have a great cold weather venue. I think that's right. I mean, a lot of times we think about the lowland as an anti-park in a sense where it becomes um, the most popular place to, to, to go when it's cold outside. And, you know, on a, on a beautiful day in the middle of summer, go outside, right? Enjoy a, enjoy a, a park like Central Park or the Highline or, a, you know, an outdoor space like the, like the, Queen's, um, the Queen's Night Market, which I, by the way, really want to go to. Uh, but I think... In the six months of the year where it's pretty miserable in a city like New York, the, the low line helps fill a, a little bit of that void. And that's what we've, we've heard a lot from people in the community, that this would give a really incredible other opportunity to, uh, uh, to use and have a public space that everyone would be able to go to for free. How do you see the night market in the context of urban design or sort of creating positive civic space and not just a business? Right. So, you know, I think one of the goals, one of the reasons we have it out in Queens is there's so many often insular or self-contained neighborhoods and often drawn by sort of ethnic bounds. Um, and we want to, you know, from sort of anecdotally as well as I think there's probably some data out there that a lot, oftentimes people in the communities don't leave their sort of their neighborhood, their community, and we wanted to create a space where we can try it. We, you know, the vision was to create a space where we can draw people from out of their neighborhoods and learn from all the other neighborhoods and uh, all the other cultures that make up Sort of New York City. You, you mentioned some of the other countries where there are night markets that your original video drew from. So is this from a certain cultural tradition that's very prevalent in Queens and that's one of the reasons for it here? Um, my personal inspiration was from the night markets of Taiwan um, and I think those are from travelers usually the most well known but they're you know they're in Hong Kong and Africa and Latin America and Western Europe so there's, a tra there's traditions of night markets all over the place. Um, but the difference is we wanted to create one that was uniquely international in nature and, you know, to really play on one of the biggest assets of New York City and Queens, which is its sort of diversity. And yeah. so we wanted to really highlight that and make that a central part of our mission. All right. So for people who want to come and spend money at the night market, whether or not they want to give to Kickstarter, what are the hours? Uh, it's 6 p.m. to midnight uh, on Saturdays at this point. There's about, we're targeting maybe another 12 or 12 Saturdays this year. And the low line, a civic space, it said in the video, it could transform a neighborhood, not just its own kind of museum space or laboratory space. How so? Well, I think uh, something that a lot, a lot of people are feeling in the city right now is uh, the density of, uh, I mean, Lower East Side has been one of the densest neighborhoods on, on certainly in the city and even on the planet um, for, for many, many years. And uh, there aren't a lot of public spaces. So a, a new uh, real estate development is actually about to emerge uh, just above the low line. And a very small amount of public space is envisioned for this. It's also right on Delancey Street, which has been one of the thoroughfares within the city um, that has been expanded and expanded, sort of uh, the asphalt has sort of taken over um, so that there's not a pedestrian dimension to it and it doesn't feel like it's at a human scale. So what I think the low line will do is actually have a, a, a space where people will feel safe and uh, will want to spend some actual sort of human time. And when will people be able to, to go to the first part? <laughs> to the low line lab, uh, it will be open this September. All right. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time for Public Intellectual, where we look at new research with the power to change our minds and public policy. 
Sexual assault has become a major issue for universities across the country as campus policies have come into question. California is considering legislation to force two years suspension for student perpetrators. And a group of U.S. senators, led by New York's Kirsten Gillibrand, are pushing for federal action to hold campuses accountable. Now a new study from Canada suggests a different approach to prevention apart from fining schools and suspending students. It involves women getting more aware of danger signs. The study, titled Efficacy of a Sexual Assault Resistance Program for University Women, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Joining us via Skype from Windsor, Ontario, lead author Charlene Sen, professor of psychology and women's and gender studies at the University of Windsor. Hello from New York. Thank you very much for joining Hello. us. First, has this been a big issue in Canada like it has in the United States recently on college campuses? Yes, it has. Yes. And what did you seek to research in your experiment? Well, we've known about the rates um, of sexual violence on campuses since about 1985, and there have been no successful prevention efforts um, at that level. So um, I was really trying to see if we gave women the knowledge, tools, and confidence that they needed, would it actually decrease um, the severity of the sexual violence they experienced? And this is what we um, found. So describe the workshops that you held. All right. Well, it might help to give you just a little scenario to start out. Um, a young woman um, answers the door one evening, and her roommate's boyfriend is there. Um, her roommate isn't home, but he insists on coming in anyway. This m feels off to her, but she's not sure. Um, he comes in, and he proceeds to act in ways that are mo making her more and more uncomfortable. But she's thinking about what her roommate is going to think, and so she starts to reason with him. These are all completely normal reactions to receiving a threat from somewhere where it's completely unanticipated. But it reduces um, our, or decreases our ability to um, detect danger and to take action. So what the program does is it increases um, women's ability to identify situations and behaviors that signal higher risk for sexual violence. And these are not the things we think stereotypically often. It assists women to work through um, emotional obstacles to seeing that danger when it's presented <laughs> by someone they know and maybe like. And then it provides self-defense training, only two hours out of the 12, but that specifically helps women to um, have tools that they could use against men they know. So and they how, how much more effective were the workshops than the brochures, and how did you measure that effectiveness? Okay. We used one of the best measures of sexual victimization, which is the Sexual Experiences Survey by Mary Koss and colleagues. Um, it's, it's the best measure because it doesn't label what happens. It doesn't call it rape or sexual violence or sexual assault. It describes something that is legally um, in, in the United States rape or um, in Canada, um, the broader category also of sexual violence or sexual assault. So what we did, um, when we compared women who had the intervention, there was a 46% decrease in the experience of, a t of completed rape at the end of one year. There is criticism of uh -huh. any study that does what you're trying to do because it focuses on the woman, the potential victim, rather than the perpetrators, and makes the victim or potential victim responsible for preventing criminal activity against her instead of the criminals or the potential criminals. Um, I'm sure you've heard this criticism. What's your response to it? Well, the first thing is that this program does not do that. It completely locates the responsibility within the male perpetrator. Um, the problem is that um, researchers have been trying to work on our campuses for many years to develop programs that could stop men from perpetrating sexual violence. But none of those, rig any, th any of the studies that have been rigorously um, evaluated um, have found no positive effects and sometimes get backlash effects. So the only successful programs are for much younger boys, um, grades 6, 7, 7, 8. So what that means is that on our campuses, we have a problem. Um, we need to give women the tools and knowledge to fight back. 
the way that we can address um, men and women on campus in another way is through successful um, bystander interventions, but those are long-term plans. Can you say what particular technique or tool or greater understanding from the workshops was the most effective single thing? No, we can't. We analyzed the 12-hour the workshop as a complete package. We had intended to compare women who missed one of the sessions to women who missed other sessions to try and identify um, which units were more effective. But um, good for the research, bad for that plan was that over 90% of the women attended three or four sessions, so there just weren't enough women who missed any one to do that comparison. So we plan to do that in the future. Can it work in high school as well as college? Absolutely. Um, I, uh, we know that 50% of all of the rapes women experience are by the time they're 18. So in many ways, university and college is too late. But also many young women don't go to university. So um, I did pilot the program in high schools, girls 16 and over, um, in some preliminary pilot tests. They were very well received by girls with some changes to the scenarios. What's your next uh, step? Do you have a follow-up study? Our next step, because um, we were waiting until it was uh, until we actually demonstrated that the program was effective or not to decide next steps. So now that we know what it is, I'm going to be developing a uh, train the trainers program over the next year, trying to find a way to. Um, actually pass on I've, uh, the information. I've been doing all the training myself, and that obviously can't continue. So we'll do that, and then universities or colleges could send people to that training, and then they could train their own facilitators at their own um, campuses. The good thing is the program was entirely funded by Canadian government money or prov and provincial government money, so it will be provided free except for the um, printing costs. You know, we just have 30 seconds left, but... Mm -hmm. Does it infuriate you that all the attempts to get men to commit less sexual violence have been failures? That's how you characterize them. It is how I characterize it. Um, there, you know, bystander education is a great thing because it, what it does is it's effective at getting the group of men who are around those men to interfere intervene. So we need to get those programs widely out there so that the perpetrators are isolated on campus. Everyone can recognize what they're doing. But we need to start much early if we actually want to prevent sexual violence. Well, thank you very much for joining us and thank sharing you. your research. Thanks very much. And that's Public Intellectual for this week. And that's our program. We're here every week at this hour. We have a new show that debuts Wednesday evenings at 7.30 each week. Next time, Give Me Your Tired, Your Poor, a special hour on immigration. We will look at budget cuts in English language training, taxi drivers trying to negotiate the health care maze, and asylum seekers hoping to breathe free and more. And tune into my radio program weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC 93.9 FM and AMA 20. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.